Okay, and we should be live. So we are working on Urza again. Prince of Krug Urza, specifically, since there's like five of him now. Five, three from this set. Um, now six, because Commander set Urza, uh, Modern Horizons Urza, and technically Blind Seer. So for tournament legal, Commander deck building purposes, we got six Urzas now. Outside of that, we got seven with the uncard one. Anyway, we are on Morning Tide right now, and I am very sore because if you watched any of my drafts recently, uh, the ones from around Christmas, I. I pulled a muscle or something in my chest, like one of my chest muscles is just in agony half the time now, and it is, it's been very sore for the past couple days, and I went to stretch today, and I thought we were getting better, and it wasn't anywhere near as bad, so we are getting better, but it still hurts so bad, so, gonna... I got my heating pad. I've actually got it under my arm near the chest muscle because it's the muscle that connects from my right arm to like the left side, of my, like to the center slash left side of my chest. That's like where I feel all the pain. So I've had it on my chest for a while and on my upper back for a while. And now I've got it under my arm on the right side to try and see like which parts of it really need to be soothed, but anyway, enough about how my body is constantly falling apart anymore. Let, let's let's get on to some magic. So, as soon as I opened up the page, before I even click start, I saw this guy, I'm like, oh hey, it's another um, Soldiers Matter card that I can't run because my soldiers don't matter in that way. Like, I make soldier tokens, but I never cast anything. Also, I might want to touch up on this. I think I did the same thing I keep saying that I can't do with Oblivion Ring, where I'm going to turn it into an artifact and copy it, and I keep thinking that I'm going to be able to easily get rid of the copy while it's on the stack, and I don't think that that's true, because so far, all of my ways to sacrifice things have been... Like, I'm not running... I'm not even running Ashnod's Altar or anything, so... Sacrifice or Phyrexian altar. So right now, I think I have Croc Clan Ironworks, and the tokens will not be uh, artifacts if I do this. But I think I made it sound like I could do that the last time, despite repeatedly pointing out that Urza does not actually make artifact creature tokens. He assumes that they're going to be artifacts because he can only target artifacts. But if you turn something into an artifact temporarily and copy it the copy will not be an artifact. That's not a copyable characteristic of it anymore. So, similarly to how if you giant grow something and then copy it, you don't get the thing with plus three, plus three stats. Like, it's the same basic principle. Or copying... My favorite one is when you copy in a, a man land. That's like the go-to one for me. If you put a clone into play and you target an animated man land you get an unanimated version of that man land because you haven't paid the activation cost on it yet, and it being a creature until end of turn is not a copyable thing, so. Uh, if a source would deal damage to a player, you may prevent X of that damage where X is the number of clerics you control. Nope. Buying and reinforce now. Zero plus three. Counter on target soldier. Each creature you control with a 1-1 one -one counter on it can block an additional creature. Eh. Changeling and Vigilance. Uh, equips to Rogues cheaper. No. Any barrage deals damage to target attacking or blocking creature equal to the number of permanents you control of the chosen type. Don't think so. Got a regimen. No target spell with that name. Like, always playable in Commander, because you'll know which Commander is the most problematic, and you can just, like, flip that player off in particular, but... 
not not what we're trying to do, and therefore kind of unnecessary. And that really is what it is. You play Declaration of Naught, you normally choose whatever the most frustrating commander at the table is, and if that one happens to be a mono-red one, they're going to be digging pretty hard for their Chaos Warp or their, you know, like, uh, Spine of Ishtar or Karn or whatever to exile a permanent, because that's super mean. Not that there aren't commanders that don't deserve that level of meanness, but it's still super mean. Uh, draw a card for each permanent you control of that type. At four mana, it's sorcery speed. By the time we have enough soldiers in play, because I would want like at least three, probably four or five, in play to make me want to spend four mana on my turn on card draw. As opposed to, you know, being able to cast it at instant speed. Because we're going to be blue. We're going to be able to draw tons of cards at instant speed. If we want to. So, <clears throat> I think that one... While it is good and scales with what we're doing, I think I'd rather just draw three cards at instant speed with another effect around this mana cost than actually spend like mana on our turn doing this when I could be using that mana at instant speed to make more soldiers basically and get their comes into play abilities uh, this is the one that equips to wizards one gains flying until end of turn and has four draw a card don't think we need that Whenever you play a spell of the type, put the charge counter on it, and then creatures get plus one. Yeah. <clears throat> Again, we're not casting enough soldiers for that to actually work. I don't think. Go to that one. And all damage will be dealt to creatures this turn. Hmm. Into a graveyard this turn, return that card to play under its owner's control. Grimoire Thief. Idyllic Tutor can only get enchantments, but it could tutor up um, Training Ground, is one of the big ones for this deck, so we're going to add it to the list anyway. Idyllic Tutor. That one is too white and a sorcery. I haven't had many cards where I don't remember what they do exactly. Like, a lot of times I pick super obscure cards, but between going through every single card in Magic multiple times this year, as we build more and more Commander decks, um, I've gotten to the point where I kind of remember most of them, so it's just the really obscure cards that I need actual game text for, so it really helps if I just put down, like, the casting cost and its card type. Sometimes, I'm scrolling through these a bit too fast, so we don't want the 210 tree folk. Um, I'm sure we won't want the kinship merfolk wizard, because we won't have many merfolk or wizards. Um, you do each opponent mills three. Okay. I'm like, look, I'm trying to scan the game text for the relevant part because there's, Kinship has a big block of text that when you reveal the card, it's usually the beginning of the upkeep. In fact, they might all be, maybe I'm forgetting that, but yeah, and then if the card matches either of the creature types on this creature, you do X, and I'm trying to find the do X part. Uh, flash flying, play a wizard, may untap it, and tap to draw and discard. A four mana two two flyer. For each other Kithkin, uh is put into a graveyard from play, put a one one white Kithkin soldier token into play for each counter it had. Uh knights have double strike. May look at the top card of your library, plus two plus two and gains flying and vigilance. Uh search the opponent's library for an instant or sorcery card. Paying its mana cost, then that player shuffles their library. 
Yeah, I've had a lot of fun with knowledge exploitation, but never from me casting it. Uh, I once commandeered somebody's knowledge exploitation, and as it turns out, they were running a uh, time stretch in their deck. And so I got to take three turns in a row between the two time stretch turns and my own turn, and that was more than enough to win the game. Did not hurt that somebody else had a Felidar Sovereign, so I stole their Sovereign on the first turn, attacked with it on the second turn, and then on my third turn I won on the upkeep because I had enough life total to match the Sovereign's requirement. After having taken the hit from the Rogue in the first place to set up the Knowledge Exploitation. Good times. Good, good times. On each creature target player controls and it has a vogue. Mm. Also, it has to specifically leave play, so making copies of it doesn't do anything at first. Unless you can get rid of them immediately thereafter. Up card of their library into their graveyard. Draw X cards. First strike, reinforce. Tap to gain flying. Mutavolt, negate. Uh, just put in t or leaves play. Put target non land permanent on top of its owner's library. Uh, there's the notorious throng. Where X is the damage dealt to your opponent this turn. If its prowl cost was paid, you time walk. Uh, plus two, plus one in haste. And warrior comes into play, attach obsidian battle axe to it. You two knight. Uh, attacks, you may put a soldier card. Yeah, we don't have enough soldier cards again. Uh, you control gains protection from the color of your choice until end of turn clash. And it bounces back to your hand. And then research is the draw card in clash. Yeah. Uh, the Revel Arc. Leaves play two creatures with power two or less. I kind of want to add it to the list because copying the Revel Arc is really powerful. But I don't know if we're going to have enough small creatures for it, but I want to add it to the list anyway, just in case we do. Yeah. B E I L L A R K. Oops. Um, put some space there. This is four white for a four three elemental. And the vote cost is five and a white. Okay. That should be all the relevant game text I need right now. I remember what the Revel Arc does. <coughs> Revel Arc is one of those cards that easily makes for infinite loops under the right circumstances. So, and we have plenty of other things that are threatening infinite loops anyway, so I don't care as much if I intentionally include another one. I'm scrolling past things too fast again. Uh, this can reinforce for white and one for one counter. Uh, this is the one for wizards, and you can remove the counter to draw a card. And that uh, comes into play with a 1-1 one, one counter. Remove a 1-1 one, one counter, destroy target enchantment. <coughs> Tap two untap wizards you control. Copy target instant or sorcery. You may choose new targets for the copy. Uh, leaves play, choose an opponent. If they have more cards, you draw cards equal to the difference. This one tutors equipment. Merfolk and wizards are cheaper. Thumbs tap, put a 1-1 one, one blue merfolk wizard into play. <coughs> Excuse me. Minus 4, minus 0, and draw a card. Uh, champion and elemental, no. Plus 2, plus 2 until end of turn. Or reinforce... Two white and X. 
Parts of your library, if one of them in your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library. Oh, it's an impulse that costs less if you've prowled. Gotcha. You tap, deal one damage, and whenever this creature is put into, or whenever a creature is put into a graveyard from play, untap this creature. Um, catch Thornbite staff to it, shaman specifically. Okay. I don't think we need the Vendillion click. Uh, this is the soldier armor, right? Uh, whenever this creature attacks or blocks, it gets plus one, plus one until end of turn for each attacking creature. And soldier comes in play, may attach veterans armaments to it. <sighs> we do go wide, but I'd rather have another coat of arm style effect as opposed to this thing. It is nice that we can attack with all of our other creatures. It's not like a exalted type thing. And it also works if we block, getting a bonus for each attacking creature coming at us, but ultimately I don't think that's going to do anything we really need. Uh, it's a giant wizard, and it's kinship as you gain four life. Uh, kinship is, if you do, each creature you control gains flying until end of turn. Uh, can attack. Tap two untap creatures you control that share a creature type. Remove enchanted creature from the game. Oh, okay. That was Morning Tide. Now we go to Shadow Moor. Shadow Moor, we have a chance of getting a bunch of cards because it has a lot of the ally color hybrids. Even Tide, we're probably just going to have like artifacts to look at for the most part. And obviously a few mono-colored spells, but all the hybrids are enemy color pairs, so white, black, blue, red, etc. But here we get all of the white, blue hybrids. Uh, look at the top five cards of your library. If you control more creatures than any other player, put two of them into your hand. Otherwise, put one of them into your hand and put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. Are you attacking or blocking creature on top and you can conspire it? Uh, play a white spell, pay one to gain a life. Uh, plus one, plus one for each planes you control and flying. Uh, deals combat damage to a player, reveal the top card of your library and put that card into your hand. You gain life equal to the CMC. But it's a three mana 2-2 two, two with no evasion. Control another white creature. Uh, can't be blocked by red creatures. Prevent damage and put a minus one, minus one on it to untap it. You control enchanted creature. At the beginning of your upkeep, put a minus one, minus one counter on it. As haste, as long as you control red. As wither, as long as you control green. Need that. Don't need the life gain doubler. As long as you control another blue creature. Uh, it's a cauldron. I don't think we need cauldron. Like, we're making too many token creatures. They can't persist anyway, so. Like, yeah, some of our other things can. We could theoretically persist Urza back or something, but that won't save any of our things that are going to die if his bonus leaves play for half a second, so. Makes me a little less inclined to run something like that as opposed to something that would save him while he's in play. Owner's hand, if that permanent is red or green, put it on top of their library instead. All cards with the same name now. First catcher. Blue creatures you control are unblockable. It's a six mana 2-2. Two -two. Plays a blue spell, you may pay one. If you do, target player puts the top two cards of their library into their graveyard. Elsewhere Flask, Enchanted Evening. Excuse me. A number of blue permanents, no. For each island you control, no. 
Draw two, discard one, and conspire. Flash flying comes into play. Attach all R's, enchanting target permanent to another permanent with the same controller. Count our target creature. Four four flyer. Other creatures are one ones. Um, like. What would we actually do with that effect? Like, all of our things are 1-1's baseline anyway, for the most part, like, because of Urza. It would make Urza himself a 1-1 and therefore way more vulnerable. And I don't plan on running Norn, I don't think. Like, original Norn, now that we're getting new Norn. New Norn I'm probably running. Oh, that was another fun thing, so... I saw, apparently, um, one of the commander's um, rules committee members, um, Sheldon, who is the only one whose name I can remember, um, because he was like the face of the rules committee for a while, apparently he thinks that New Norn is ban-worthy in commander to like an extreme degree, and that both amuses and annoys me mostly because there have been so many other degenerate cards that it's just like why aren't these banned you know like Thassa's Oracle you know is if you've ever played against a deck that randomly has Thassa's Oracle in it in Commander um, with the intent of winning with it so it usually gets paired up with cards that wind up exiling their entire deck all of a sudden it's basically if you've ever played against the decks that win with Thassa's Oracle in other constructed formats it's like that except it seems to happen at random because you know that's not what the decks are meant for but they are capable of doing it and so the cards are just kind of jammed in there and like, you could be doing perfectly fine in a game of Commander, and suddenly somebody will go, I'm going to Demonic Consultation, and it's just like, oh god, they also have blue, that means they're about to Thassa's Oracle and win, and I don't have a Counterspell. Or a, um, Stifle Effect for the Oracle Trigger. Yeah. But when I see that, and, like, he's freaking out about this card, like, fr from the tone of the letter that he wrote or the article that he posted I'm not sure what it was originally but I did I was I saw the uh, commander's quarters article on it like and just reading the excerpts from it makes it sound like he saw this card and went oh my god this is going to destroy commander so I don't know I really like the new Norn I think she's incredibly powerful and is probably, like, you don't have to include any card in Commander. Like, I think the most must-include card is probably Soul Ring. Uh, so I don't think that a card that is incredibly powerful and should be in most decks makes it ban-worthy. I think the problem is if the card becomes unreasonably frustrating to play against... And, you know, less fun to play with, too, um, is really, like, the driving force behind banning a card, especially in a more casual-oriented format like Commander. Like, Norn is definitely powerful. New Norn is absurdly powerful, but a lot of cards are very absurdly powerful in Commander, and I don't think New Norn is so game-breaking. I think she's, like, she comes down, and she's going to need to die soonish, because, as a general rule, players run, uh, lots of good comes into play abilities in their deck in Commander. Like, that's a thing in Commander. Comes into play abilities are very powerful, and, because you need to get value from your creatures consistently. I forget if I even... I think I touched on this when talking about Norn herself and why I thought Norn was great for Commander and why I'm going to be running her as we scroll down through like this Gain Life butterfly that we're not running. Um, control Shroud and Enchanted Creatures you control Shroud. No. 
So, in Commander, you do need your creatures a lot of the times to do something when they come into play, when they die, uh, have an effect on the board while they're in play that generate, like, almost all of your creatures have to do something in Commander when they come down while or while they're in play or because they were removed from play. If it's not doing one of those three things, it has to be so incredibly on topic with your deck to merit the deck space that it's using. Because everybody runs removal in huge quantities in Commander, and your things are not long for this gaming world when they come down, so they have to do something while they're in play or because they came into play, or because they're going to leave play. Most of the time, in order to make the cut in Commander, unless your group is, like, super casual, barely concerned about winning, just play the cards that make you smile. And that's literally it. Like, you're going to want your creatures to have some kind of effect on the game just for existing. Because if you play a creature that needs to sit and play and attack and block, a lot of the times that's going to be very bad. This is why Boots and Greaves are in almost all of my decks, is because if your creature needs to attack in order to get its thing off, it needs to be able to attack the turn it comes down. Like, that that's a given. Because it probably, if its effect is good enough, it's not going to make it to the next turn if it's not either protected or hasted or both <clears throat> so that way you actually get the effect once so so Norn is very powerful for shutting off your opponents comes into play abilities which is one of the best ways to get immediate value out of a creature is the comes into play ability <clears throat> so also a lot of cards in Commander benefit you from doing your other things, so anything that cares when you put a preferred permanent type from your deck into play is also going to be um, uh, negatively impacted by Norn on the opposing side. So Norn is very potent in that regard, and a lot of players you know, put good comes in play effects in their deck and cards that benefit them when they're preferred permanent types come into play, like you build an artifact-centric deck, you're going to want things that when an artifact comes into play, or if you're making like a billion treasures, you know, something when an artifact comes into play is going to be a very good card in your deck. More often than not, so Norn doubling that up for you, or taking that away from the opponent who built their deck around that, very potent effect. That being said, Norn's just a card, like if you can't cast another comes into play effect or trigger another comes into play effect immediately after playing Norn, she's probably going to die before you get back around to your turn. And she is probably going to get killed by the player that wants their cool comes into play ability to trigger. So you have to protect Norn at that point and you have to keep protecting her in order to get what you want out of her. I don't think she's anywhere near, like, ban-worthy. She's definitely powerful. She's definitely going to be an include in a lot of my commander decks. I'm pretty sure every deck I have that runs white, except for my Planeswalker-centric uh, deck, my five-color Planeswalker deck, which can run Torpor Orb. That's how much it doesn't care about its own comes into play abilities um, is going to be a like she's going to be in every other one of my base white decks I believe just because of the way she interacts with both my good comes into play effects and my opponents wanting to have comes into play effects so so yeah I think Norn's incredibly powerful I don't think she's ban worthy like I would have to play against a lot. I could see her maybe getting to ban-worthy status in more competitive EDH circles, especially, like, actual 
competitive EDH where shutting off all of your opponent's good comes into play abilities is just going to wreck them if Norn's not killed immediately. Um, I can also see her being frustrating for players that are so all in on good comes into play abilities that their removal for Norn is primarily on comes into play abilities. You know, if your removal package is, you know, like Ravenous Chupacabra and Gear Hulk and um, the one from um, Lorwyn. Um, wow, his name's gone out. Shriek Maw. Yeah, if, like, that's your removal package, is, like, creatures like that coming into play and killing stuff because they came into play, Norn's going to wreck you pretty hard, but most decks are going to have a handful of instant speed targeted creature removal spells, and I don't think Norn is so good that she's going to... that she deserves to get banned, so I'm going to be really interested to see if she does and what the reaction is going to be. But yeah, if you've if you've seen the uh, article that Sheldon wrote or any of the coverage on it, um, so the rules committee team actually gets to see the cards before they're finalized for printing to make sure there's nothing like too egregious for Commander or, you know, Basically, they're there to give Wizards insight into what Commander players are going to be doing with the cards to make sure... Because Commander is, right now, like, the constructed format that is driving sales. And, it, like, Standard has not been the driving format for a while now. And Commander has usurped it in that regard. Because trying to stay constantly competitive for Standard gets very expensive and very time-consuming and tiring because you have to grab each new standard legal set when it comes out and adjust your deck accordingly, and sometimes, like, whole deck archetypes get demolished by new cards, <clears throat> and suddenly you have to be playing a completely different deck in order to still be competitive. So standard is one of the more expensive things to stay current on, at least when you're playing like, you know, an eternal format, the initial investment is way higher but unless your deck gets banned or something actually comes along that completely upends it normally you don't have to change decks if you don't want to in more eternal formats, you just need to adjust the thing that you're playing for the new meta rather than having to completely overhaul the deck. Whereas Standard has such a smaller card pool that you can't just go grab some other cards in your color to upend the new problem deck. You sometimes have to completely switch strategies. And so, like I said, the Eternal formats have a way steeper entry fee to start playing them, but usually once you do your deck tends to stay relevant for a while. You can keep playing it and tuning it rather than having to abandon it entirely the way standard sometimes makes you do. Also, after like at a maximum of two years, you have to abandon your deck because it's going to rotate. So even if you really like your deck and nothing in it ever got banned eventually you have to give up on that deck and start playing something new, and the Eternal formats, your deck is just there, unless it gets banned. So, you know, if you're not playing Splinter Twin, you're probably fine type of deal. So, but yeah, Standard, Standard is too expensive for a lot of people, so Commander has become, like, the constructed format of choice. Also, Commander is, like, all over the place, power level-wise. Like, you can build stuff that's fun and uh, wonky and whatnot and just have fun with the format. Or you can build, like, the most competitive and brutal deck you can possibly build, and both of those are completely valid strategies for Commander. It just depends on your playgroup, really, whether or not you should be building either type of deck or something in between. Um, 
so yeah, so Wizards, because they care about Commander, because it is one of the things that is driving sales the most for them, that's why we have Commander products attached to, like, every set now, and why we have, like, you know, instead of getting, like, 50 new legendary creatures in a year, we got, like, almost 300 this year, so... They want. They know that players want to play Commander, and they keep throwing more and more legendary creatures at us, and more Commander-based products at us, and all of that. So, when the um, sets are going before the sets are finalized, they do show the cards to the Commander Rules Committee to make sure there's nothing that's going to destroy Commander, basically. Like, they don't want to have to ban a card right when it comes out in Commander without knowing... Like, Lutri, they knew, and they banned him ahead of time because his he's a companion, and his companion requirement is to basically be playing Commander. Like, that he is worded as such that you have to be playing a 60-card deck that would fit you know, the guidelines for Commander and that there's only one of each card in the deck. That's not a basic land, so... Lutri had to get banned prematurely because he was basically an auto-include in blue-red, and some people are like, that. that's silly, but yeah, Companions were dumb, and Lutri was a free card, and his effect is powerful enough in a lot of blue-red decks that you should... Like, there's no reason to not have Lutri in the Companion slot in your blue-red commander deck so they just wound up banning him so that you don't get a free extra card just by existing in blue red or any deck that includes blue and red but for the most part they don't want to have to ban a card that is going to come out in commander immediately you know and from the way Sheldon worded his article, it sounds like he was so desperate that they don't print it that he wants to see um, Norm banned, basically. <clears throat> Fortunately, he's one of, I believe, five people now that gets to do the Commander Rules Committee, so... <clears throat> Although at least one other person, he didn't name who it was, he did say after talking to them, though, that they had also... Uh, share similar opinions, so I'm really hoping Norn does not get banned unless she's actually destroying Commander, because I really like this Norn, and I am excited to run her in Commander. And I'm also frustrated that we we ban a card that I'm interested in playing, but when I see a card that's just like, that seems like it's going to warp Commander around it and it doesn't get banned, and then I play with it, and it does the kind of things that I thought it was going to do. It's like, why, why do we have a ban list if we're not going to put the most problematic cards on it? Personally, um, I would not mind seeing Thassa's Oracle go. Uh, I also would not mind seeing um, Bolus' Citadel leave Commander, because if you've ever resolved Bolus' Citadel in a game where you start with 40 life, and you still have, like, 25 to 30 of that life left. Um, <clears throat> that, that, game, that game goes a lot in your favor all of a sudden. And if you have Sensei's Divining Top at the same time, it tends to go entirely in your favor at that point. Like, it's, despite the huge casting cost on spells in Commander, um, being able to spend a life to get the ones you don't want to have to pay life to cast off the top by top swapping and then paying the life to one life to cast Sensei's Divine Top again usually allows you to dig through your entire deck. Uh, Yawgmoth's Bargain is banned in Commander um, for basically the same reason, and being able to build your own Yawgmoth's Bargain or just have the ability to bypass casting costs on the top card of your deck and pay life instead. Usually, like, every time I do it, I get, like, so giddy playing all of the cards off the top of my deck that I tend to put myself dead on board while I'm setting up my win condition, but, you know, that's just me because I'm having fun with Commander. Uh, I definitely believe that if I stopped and thought about it for more than a couple seconds, um... 
I would be able to actually cobble together a winning strategy very quickly off of those two cards in like 25 plus life. So, <clears throat> so yeah, when we talk about banning cards in Commander, I just kind of roll my eyes at that because there are so many things going on that are just way worse. And we just keep ignoring them because my joke is that the cards on the ban list for Commander are the cards that make Sheldon sad when he plays Commander. Um, <clears throat> and to have him look at Norn and go, yeah, no, that needs to be banned. It's going to absolutely destroy Commander. I'm just like, wow, that's that's a reaction. Like, yes, I agree. Everybody runs good comes into play effects. And a lot of people build their decks around good comes into play effects sometimes. But I don't think Norn is ban worthy. I think she's very powerful. And there are a lot of, like, Commander is just a wash with incredibly powerful cards. So it has to be something where it's just like, th this is detracting from the actual fun of Commander. Like, this is miserable, or, like, maybe maybe Bolas of Citadel doesn't deserve to get banned because you don't always get it when you need it and can cast it, and sometimes it gets blown up before you get to do all the cool stuff with it. <clears throat> maybe I'm being a grumpy old man about that, but I feel like Thassa's Oracle, because of the decks that run it, just randomly win out of left field on an axis that players aren't normally defending well against. Because if you deplete your entire deck, Thassa's Oracle just needs to come into play and trigger. And if it does that at all, uh, you win the game. Because if there's no cards left in your deck, even if your Devotion to Blue is zero, you are looking at the same number of cards that are left in your deck. Like, it, zero does, in fact, equal zero as far as magic is concerned. So you do win the game. So Thassa's Oracle might be... And I haven't even really... Like, I've played against decks that are using Thassa's Oracle and it didn't do the thing that they wanted it to do at the time. Like, they never got to the point where they could deplete their entire deck. But it was in there, and they were trying for it. <clears throat> but yeah, so... Uh, that's just me, though. That's my rant about somebody else ranting about a card that hasn't even been printed yet. Physi I mean, I suppose it's been physically printed. It hasn't made it to the um, store shelves yet, and won't for about a month. But uh, I'm super excited for Norn. I want to try her out and see how well she plays. And I'm willing to accept that she might be too powerful, but <clears throat> I don't read her and go, oh no, that's, <clears throat> that's too powerful, that needs to be banned. I read her and go, that's really strong and I would like to try it out in all of my white decks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Like, that—that that is my response to Norn, is I, I want to try her out and see if she plays as well as she reads. Like, she got me excited for the set coming out. There's always at least one card that I see in the set where I'm like, I want to put that... I have, a, I have so many commander decks, there's always going to be one card that I look at and go, that needs to go in, like, this deck. That is, like, perfectly designed for this deck. And sometimes it doesn't even make it into the deck because... That strategy is what the deck is all about, and therefore the new card isn't good enough when I actually look at what I'm supposed to take out for it. <clears throat> and that always makes me a little sad. Like, you know, I'll see, like, this really cool card that copies spells when you cast them, and I'll be like, ah, that's perfect for my Nin deck. And then I'm going through Nin, and it's like, but I'm not taking out, <clears throat> you know, Twinning Staff, or Swarm Intelligence, or Melek, or... And I just go down the list, and it's like, yeah, this isn't as good as any of these other cards that are copying my spells when I cast them. Like, I took cards out of my deck that are better than this, because I need to make room for the ones that are in there, and then I get sad, because I can't actually run the cool new thing that does the stuff. Uh, I don't need spawn. Target creature lose flying. No. Number of white permanents you control and has vigilance. Plus two, plus two. 
Uh, the target opponent removes the top card of their library from the game until end of turn. You may play that card. No. Creature with power two or less from the game, they gain four life. Two counters, move a counter from target creature onto another target creature. This is one life, which I can't even run anyway because it's a black land. <sighs> Wither and is put into a graveyard from play, put a minus one, minus one counter on each creature that already has one of those counters on it. Uh, control no parents of the chosen color, sacrifice scarecrow, that's a red land. Destroy all non white creatures, would hit all of our soldier tokens, so. Game flying until end of turn. Turn target artifact or enchantment card in a graveyard to its owner's hand. As conspire. Probably not. Uh, each other creature becomes a copy of target non-legendary creature until end of turn. But I want to make them all copies of my legendary creature and then have Mirror Gallery out. Uh, Lifelink protection from convert mana cost three or greater. Um, at end of turn. Hmm. Uh, put a card in your graveyard on the bottom of your library, and the blue one, look at the top card of target player's library. Okay. I don't need either of them. Might be in the market for Mystic Gate. I don't know yet. We have so many non-basic lands on the list already, I can see not running it. Target creature becomes white until end of turn. Tap it and draw a card. Uh, return target creature card with CMC three or less from your graveyard to play. Probably not. Your servant's banned. Protection from the color of its controller's choice until end of turn. Plus one toughness. Untap sad mana. Flash Flying Defender. Uh, comes into play. Target permanent becomes the color of your or colors of your choice until end of turn. Uh, chain creature can't attack or block, and its activate abilities can't be played. Another creature comes into play, you may attach it. You may exchange control of target non land permanent you control and target non land permanent opponent controls with an equal or lesser mana cost. Top card of your library, you may remove it from the game. Under target spell, you may shuffle up to one target card from your graveyard into your library. Uh, this one has persist if you have a black creature and haste if you have a red. Two Kithkins if white was paid. Counter up to one target creature spell if blue was paid. White creatures you control have tap gain one life. Untap creature you control. Target creature gets plus one plus one until end of turn. Uh, or another permanent is put in, into play from your graveyard draw card. Or spell is played from the graveyard draw card. Can't run run servant halo no. It's to savor the moment no. No to these two scarecrows. No to her. Doesn't untap, enchant creatures, one, put a minus one, minus one counter on it, untap it. Answer comes into play, you may tap target creature. Good old spectral procession. Spell siphon. Steal the godhead. Gives one one in lifelink if it's white, and one one in unblockable if it's blue. Probably not. Soil R and equipment attached to target creature. 
uh, would deal damage to them. That sources controller draws that card, that many cards instead. Can't have counters. Plus one, plus one until end of turn. Blue spell gains flying. Flash buffs your white creatures, buffs your blue creatures. A lot of my stuff's going to be colorless though, so. Wither if you control green, Vigilance if you control white. So the white blue one is Vigilance and Flying, right? It's like a Sarah Angel of some sort, potentially based on the stats. Uh, I don't think I want Thought Reflection. Opponents control and untap all creatures you control. No. Uh, remove target creature from the game, return it to play under its owner's control at end of turn. Comes into play, return to your hand all cards in your graveyard, put there from play this turn, and she has Persist. Uh, there we go, it's a 4 mana 2 4 Flying Vigilance. Okay. Attack unless defending player controls a blue permanent. No. Minus one, minus one counter on end of combat. No. Attacking creatures you control off lifelink. No. Target creature if you do gain two life. Return all permanents to their owner's hand. Each player chooses up to seven cards in their hand and shuffles the rest into their library. Empty all mana from mana pools. That's what it is. Okay. I was trying to figure out, like, where this thing isn't upheaval, and it's the empty the mana pools part. <clears throat> Since you have to do everything in order on it before it's done and you can get priority to cast a spell again. The empty the mana pools part is what stops you from being able to dump your hand back onto the table real quick while everybody else is trying to rebuild. Alright, so that was Shadow Moore, so now even tied. Should be very quick. <clears throat> Especially since I don't plan on ranting anymore about what is and is not banned in Commander. And what should or shouldn't be. Uh, power and tap is equal. All right, number of creatures, and you have to tap five on tap creatures to untap it. <clears throat> uh, white permanent gains persist. Or white creature gains persist, rather. It's a five drop. Probably not. Again, most of our stuff is going to be colorless soldier tokens, and even if they do happen to be white, um,. Them persisting is not going to do anything, so it only works on the creatures we might want to animate and copy. Uh, Archive of Justice is put into a graveyard from play. Remove target permanent from the game. As far as things go, turning things into artifacts and copying it, it's definitely a fun thing to have, because then when somebody rasps the board, I get to remove a bunch of permanents from the game. I don't know that that's better than any of the other things I'm doing, though. We'll have to see. If I have better stuff to be copying than this guy, then we won't bother, but... White, white for an Archon. It's a 4 4. Okay. Uh, tap, tap target creature. Whenever you play a white spell, untap it. <coughs> uh, target creature gains tap, return target non land permanent to its owner's hand. Return target permanent you control to owner's hand. Two Kithkin soldiers and has retrace. Can our spell draw a card? Comes into play, draw a card if you played another blue spell this turn. 
Search your library for any number of planes cards. Remove them from the game. Shuffle your library. Begin your upkeep. You may put a card you own removed from the game with endless horizons into your hand. All damage will be dealt to you and permanent you control this turn. Creature gains wither. And return that card under its owner's control at end of turn. Okay. Hammer die. Lenalendra Archmage. Lenalendra is one of the ones that normally makes it into my deck just because I'm playing blue. Also, I would not mind making copies of her that I can then sacrifice to counter spells even if they won't come back. Blue creatures, draws cards if your hand is empty. So red creature haste. Destroy target enchantment. Black or red permanent target opponent controls. Uh, whenever you play a spell, a creature gets plus two, plus two. Each creature you control gets plus one, plus one for each white mana symbol and its mana cost. <clears throat> Loyal Griffalcon, Defender Flying, play a white spell, loses Defender. Means Flying, play a blue spell, untap it, draw a card and retrace. One untap to make a soldier. Turn to a creature with a counter on it to owner's hand. Backer block at the beginning of your upkeep, you may gain one life. It's a mill card. Works with scarecrows. Blue creature shroud. E shroud. The zero one goat token for each white mana symbol in the mana cost of permanence you control. So it gives you a zero one goat based on your devotion to white. Let's have hybrid activations. Permanent you control becomes untapped. Wake Thrasher gets plus one plus one until end of turn. Uh, controls more creatures than you. Can't play creature cards. Yeah, I'm going to make way too many tokens for that. Never be good, and I don't really care about the other pieces of it. Alright, so that was even tied. Next we go to shards. What time is it now? Almost noon? Okay, we got plenty of time. <clears throat> Exalted, yeah. Probably not running any of the Exalteds. We're going to be a go wide strategy. Let's turn and cycling two. Flying Exalted and gains lifelink. Nice hand. Its controller draws a card. Their graveyard. <clears throat> Vigilance. Doesn't untap. Sacrifice it to draw two cards. And whenever you gain life, you may pay white and one. If you do, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature for each one life you gain. Deals one damage to target attacking or blocking creature. First strike shroud. Destroys an artifact or enchantment. Make soldiers. It's plus three, plus three, and flying until end of turn, and then you make your non planeswalker stuff indestructible. Um, would we care at all about Elspeth, Knight Errant? 
I mean, we're already potentially getting the indestructible from the um, Dark Steel Forge. So I don't think I need that. And the other two effects are okay, but not amazing in Commander, so. A card that has black activation. X spells you play cost one less. Hmm. How many artifacts am I going to have that I would actually want the Ethereum Sculptor? The answer is probably enough that I'm at least interested in it. Sculptor. And maybe the Canonist. The Canonist is going to require me to have like more artifacts. Like I'm going to have to cut a bunch of the Canon. Oops. Spelling your name. Oh no. N I S T. There we go. Only that part. Really? Oh, it's only one N in the front, too. There we go. So, her thing is that you can't play more than one non artifact spell each turn, and that's true for all players. <clears throat> so, her primary benefit is in a deck where I just want to play. Urza, basically, and everything else is going to be an artifact. Um, we'll have room for some number of non-artifacts, but for the most part, we just want to jam artifacts with her. So, if we get to the part where Ethereum Sculptor is insane, and my deck is almost exclusively artifacts, except for a handful of very important enchantments and creatures, <clears throat> then the Canonist might make it, just because it stops other players from casting more than one spell per turn. The downside to the Canonist is that it makes counter spells because they're never artifacts, because they're never permanents. Um, way more clunky, because I can't protect a spell I'm trying to resolve with a counter spell. But then again, neither can anybody else if they're trying to cast a non-artifact spell to begin with, because they've already played their one spell for the turn. So yeah, the Canonist might not make it, but if I'm running a heavy enough artifact build, then she might just on the value of that. A card. Eh. Flying. Oh. Count the number of cards in your library. Your life total becomes that number. Can't run any of the Trilands. Flying and unearth bounces non land permanents and unearths. Gain seven life, draw two cards. No. Not sorcery speed. Light soldier creature token in play. Sacrifice a soldier, prevent all combat damage that will be dealt this turn. I mean, if I can make as many soldiers as I want, maybe. This is Knight Captain of Eos. Four, white, two, two, human knight. PBs to make how many? A soldier to fog. Okay. I don't know if we're going to have room for that. The fact that I can keep making soldiers, though, does make this thing more appealing. So 
So while making other things into artifacts and copying them won't get them the buff, most of my stuff is going to be artifacts. I'm wondering if I want the Master of Ethereum at all. Like, it will buff most of the tokens Urza makes, if not all of them. And Urza can make more copies of him afterwards, giving all of them you know, more buffs as they come in, both because they will buff the entire team anyway, and because there'll be more artifact creatures in play to buff each copy of the Master of Ethereum. Maybe I can see cutting this, though, because it's just going to be a big, dumb creature a lot of the time. Tap, regenerate, target artifact. No. Players can't search libraries. I don't think so. Like, I like to tutor a lot. So. It, maybe I shouldn't run that. Especially since I'm going to be running fetch lands, most likely. Yeah, we already have Oblivion Ring on the list. You 2 Exalted for four... Proto Matter Powder, return target artifact card from your graveyard to play. But it's like five mana to activate and three to cast? Yeah, no. I'm good, thanks. Where am I going to cost one or less? Probably not. Book of Progenitus. Sounding Silence. Yeah, we can't run any of the resounding cards. He has green. Comes into play, you may return target artifact card from your graveyard to your hand. Yeah. Sanctum. Gargoyle. It's three, white. Gargoyle, two, three. Two, three. Yeah, I could see my artifact base grave digger making it in except for artifacts and lands only during the upkeep <clears throat> it would still kill urza is one of the biggest problems like i don't mind it killing the token copies of non artifact permanents that I'm cloning into soldiers, but I definitely mind it killing Urza. Because I think Urza's going to die a lot anyway. To stop me from... Basically to make it more expensive to activate him. Like, so that I can't cast him and activate him in the same turn. That being said, it's a fine thing to pop when Urza's down. Or when me getting to keep all of my artifacts is fine. Or if I can just turn Urza into an artifact while we're at it. I'll add it to the list. I'll probably run the other ones over it that kill Don Artifact Permanents, but... It's okay, we'll add the game text later. Uh, artifact creature you control deals combat damage to a player. You may get a 1-1 one, one Thopter token into play. <coughs> so, she is an artifact creature. And multiple copies of her would stack. So I would be getting 3-3 three, three flyers for each artifact creature I control that deals combat damage. Yeah, we'll add it to the list. I think it's going to depend which direction I ultimately go with this deck. Yeah. I do have to mention that she is an artifact sphinx, so I don't forget that relevant bit of game text. <clears throat> because you can build this deck 
specifically to focus on the potential infinite combos Urza can generate, or you can build it to just <clears throat> keep stacking value. You know, every copy of Sharding Sphinx makes every other one more ridiculous because they will get in for damage as 4-4 four, four flyers or 3-3 three, three flyers for the copies. So the main one would be a 6-6, six, six, and the other ones would be 3-3s. Three, and every time one of them connects, you get that many 3-3 three, three flyers for each. <laughs> because you get one for every Sphinx you have at that point, per one that gets through, and per one, yeah. <clears throat> so, and then the normal thing will happen in Commander, where you'll start doing something like that, and all of a sudden, somebody will go, you know what, this needs to stop, and we're going to wrath the board now. As long as the top card of your library is an artifact or creature skill bar or has its activated abilities. Don't think that's relevant. Unless they pay one in cycling, no. <clears throat> uh, uh, Tezzeret. Well, we're going to have to add Tezzeret to the list and then see. So the big thing about Tezzeret is he is a 5-mana tutor and artifact with CMC 4 or less from your deck into play. Like that, that is his baseline in artifact-based decks. And if you tutor anything less than that into play... Then you get to keep him, and then you get to untap your artifacts uh, every turn until you get his loyalty up high enough that you can go tutor for something else that you need. But yeah, Tezzeret is just... If you have a good 4 or lower artifact that you would spend 5 mana to put into play from your deck, like, if you could spend 5 mana to demonic tutor it, up, but then put it directly into play, um, then Tezzeret is 100% worth it in your blue decks. If you don't have artifacts like that, then you don't want Tezzeret most of the time, or this Tezzeret anyway. Unless you also have, like, crazy combos you can do with his untapping ability, because you can do some very degenerate things with that, and Rings of Bright Earth, and artifacts that tap for multiple mana. Like, if you plus one him to untap two artifacts, and one of them is Gilded Lotus, and then you pay the two to copy it, uh, then you get to tap the Gilded Lotus for mana. So you get more mana. So then if you need... Then you just need one of the other artifacts to be, like, Chain Veil or something, and you just go infinite at that point. Because you get to copy his ability to untap those two artifacts again. So now you're getting six mana. It's four to activate the chain veil. So you have the two left over. So you just keep going until you're satisfied. And since we will be running things like Rings of Bright Hearth, we might be able to get... We, gen we do get to the point where he generates huge amounts of mana at the very least, by copying the ability, so it just becomes a question of do we have enough other stuff going on? <clears throat> like I said, if his minus is worth it for the deck, if you have enough things that you want to copy with him, or I'm sorry, enough things that you want to tutor with him, then <clears throat> that's really all you need to justify Tezzeret being in the deck. <clears throat> and then the rest of his abilities are just gravy at that point. But if you don't have an artifact that powerful in that casting cost range, then you probably don't want Tesseret, even if you can do other things with his plus. But then again, most of the things you can do with his plus means that you're going to have artifacts in your deck that you would like to tutor for with him anyway, so... Salted Domain, no. 
bone saw? Absolutely not. No. Black or red permanent from the game. Zero. Doesn't untap. Only gets the bonus once. Creatures your opponents control get minus one power. That is hilarious when you make a whole bunch of them against very creature-centric decks until they kill all of your little guys. <clears throat> but... Yeah, can be fun, but I don't think it's actually anywhere near good enough. Cormorants, flying, bounces an artifact each upkeep, yeah. Fires black mana... Top three cards of your library may reveal an artifact and put it into your hand, put the rest on the bottom. We can do better. Ooh, excuse me. Blue tap, draw and discard. Plus one, plus two, and untap them. Basic land cycling. Uh, target land you control becomes the basic land type of your choice. Barbary counter on target creature you don't control, its controller draws a card. Creatures with Barbary counters on them can't attack or block. <coughs> well, we can't target, target, excuse me, Inkwell, so we can't make a bunch of 3-3 three, three Island Walk Trample Shroud creatures. Uh, one damage that would be dealt to target creature or player this turn. Target creature is unblockable this turn. <coughs> Light of Stone, Lapse of Certainty, no, no. Uh, prevent all non-combat damage that will be dealt to creatures you control. <clears throat> um, make Soldier Tokens. Um, destroy all other creatures. Yeah, no. If it was destroy all non-soldier creatures, maybe. Uh, return an artifact you control to owner's hand. You may put an artifact card from your hand into play. <sighs> so the big thing about Master Transmuter is <clears throat> it lets you bypass all of the... <clears throat> um, higher casting costs on your Doomsday Artifacts. It is four mana to caster and one in tap to do this, so that can be a bit difficult. <clears throat> Alright, this is Conflux, not... But if we can do that, then... <clears throat> it's usually worth it. If you're getting things like Darkseal Forge into play that much faster... It's worth it. Although we do have Arkham already, and we'll probably have Muzio <clears throat> when we get to Conspiracy, but <clears throat> I do think we want to consider it. Oh, hey, there's Path to Exile. To Exile. Um, yep. We are a base blue deck, so Reliquary Tower... Definitely worth considering. <clears throat> Control a green permanent draw card. No. 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 Gains fear and vigilance. Enchantment. No. Talman performance. <clears throat> Dramatic visions. Unsummon. Owner's hand. Defender flying, you may gain life equal to the power of target creature you control. No, and worldly council. No. <coughs> Alright, and Alara Reborn will have cards because we're a multicolor deck, so we can at least consider the white blue cards. <coughs> uh, Ardent Plea. No. Mind Sensor, or Mimeomancer, not Mind Sensor. Uh, beginning of your upkeep, you may put a Feather Counter on target creature. If you do, that creature is a 3-1 and has flying, as long as it has a Feather Counter on it. 1-3. <coughs> uh, 
Inventory Exalted. All damage will be dealt to artifact creatures this turn. Guild Miss Border Post. Maybe? I do like the Border Posts. I wish we would uh, finish the cycle for them. So, if you don't know what these things are, they are three mana mana rocks that tap for one mana of two different colors, and they cost those colors to cast. But what you can also do is you can spend one mana and return a basic land you control to owner's hand to cast them instead. <clears throat> um, they come into play tap. So basically, if you don't have a land drop for the turn, and you have basic lands in play, you pay the one and from that basic land, like you tap your planes, you return it to your hand, you play the field mist border post, and then you play the planes as your land for the turn. So that way, basically, you're using it to be in place of a land drop. And then if you have plenty of lands, then you can just cast it. Um, so that way you can develop out your board normally, and then it's still ramping you. Like if you have, if you played your third land and you're going to hit your fourth land next turn, you can just cast it if you want to. Uh, another artifact comes into play under your control, gets plus one, plus one, and is unblockable. <sighs> yeah, I kind of scrolled over the filigree angel, where you gain three life for each artifact you control, but that's like an eight drop. So, if we're going infinite with Urza, like if we're just going to make as many soldiers as we want, um, Glass Dust Hulk will be able to one-shot somebody from full, as it'll just keep getting plus one, plus one until we stop making artifact creatures, and then it's unblockable. You can also cycle it early if we're missing things. I'm going to add him to the list. I don't know if he'll actually make it or not. I don't think we need meddling mage. Plus it's controller pays four, gain four life, no defender and land cycling, no. Equip creature blocks a creature, that creature doesn't untap, no. Uh, we don't have the auras for the guardians. Uh, creatures you control gain flying and it cascades. Two, three, flyer. Uh, tap, untap another target permanent. And Defender Flying in Shroud. Okay. Now, real quick, Glass Dusk Hulk was... How much mana to cast? Is three white blue for a three four golem. Okay. All right, now we can go back. All right, so that was Alara Reborn. We are now on Zendikar. Zendikar. Yeah, all right. What sort of fun things can we find in our good friend Zendikar? Well... Oh, ah, no, there it goes. <clears throat> I was going to say if it would actually start searching for it, but it did, finally. Uh, kicker, and it's a 1-1 one, one unblockable. Meh. Archive trap, no. Care about Archmage Ascension. Arid Mesa, though. As stated previously, and in every one of my videos... I do love me some fetch lands, since I plan on running Sensei's Divining Top. Uh, other core creatures you control get plus two, plus two for each equipment attached to Armament Master. Uh, attacking, five damage, no. Graveyard from the battlefield, no. No. Old defenses. 
gets kicked, they get plus two, plus two in first strike. Choose a color. White creatures you control gain protection from the chosen color until end of turn. It's flying. Counter target. Oh, it's cancel. Uh, one five lifelink. Carnage altar. Celestial mantle. Double its controller's life total. Hmm. Eh. Mountain walk. Uh, six core soldier creature tokens. If it was kicked, you get 12. Count on Trickster, Day of Judgment. Pro Black, enter the battlefield, exile target black permanent. This one flying and indestructible. Begin of your upkeep, sacrifice a creature. If you can't, sacrifice Eldrazi Monument. Yeah, making token copies of that. Huh. Just thought of something, though. Uh, whoops. I mean to click off of that. Yeah, my screen just wandered off. I don't know. We need to duplicate tab, not a uh, new tab. Sorry. Alright. So, real quick. Because I have it on the list, and now that I'm thinking about it, it's actually a problem. So, Acroma's Memorial... Is that thing actually legendary? Yes, it is. Yeah, for some reason when I was going through, I forgot that Akroma's Memorial was legendary, so we probably want to cut that off of the list. I was looking at Eldrazi Monument, and I'm like, yeah, I'd rather have Akroma's Memorial where my stuff will be, you know, um, protection from colors and whatnot, but if it's legendary, that's going to be a problem. Like, we might possibly be running some of the cards that can make non-legendary copies of things, but I don't think we're going to be running Duplomancy. It's more likely we'll run Helm of the Host. And so we won't ever be, like, in order for that to work, we have to wait until an opponent tries to target and destroy a Chroma's Memorial. Then we make a copy of it in response, let the original one die, and then the copy is now a creature, and then we can put the helm on it, and then we can make it. That's just so many hoops to jump through, so. Which makes me sad, because I did like the idea of running a Chromus Memorial in this deck, but. I think we need Eternity Vessel. Expedition Map, though, we might want just for the Urzatron and whatnot. should consider that one. Spyglass, no. Sovereign, no. No. Yeah. I had to go back and make sure it had Defender on top of that. But yeah, we weren't likely to run Gomazoa anyway. No to that. No to Hedron Crab. No. No, I own his band. No, 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 no. Uh, definitely not. No, 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 no. Kick, destroy target artifact or enchantment. No. No. Planes, no. Uh, minus three, minus O. Ice, no, unless you return a land, no. Lorthos, no. <coughs> uh, spell or abilities counter, make a Murpho. Tap seven Murpho, counter target spell. <coughs> we could jam Luminarch Ascension just because. But I think I'd rather stay on topic. Luminarch Ascension is one of those cards I tend to put in a lot of my commander decks, especially one that's going to care about token making. Um, <clears throat> because if you cast it on turn two, you will normally be able to activate it on turn three. Like, that—that that is the play pattern with Luminarch. Most players do not deploy threats on turn one, 
so that they can attack you on turn two to stop you from being able to activate this thing on turn three. So, yeah. <clears throat> Normally, <clears throat> I'm going to lose my voice here. <clears throat> Normally, you just don't ha get attacked often enough. Now, Luminarch Ascension does not just win you the game when you do that. It usually makes you the primary target and... You'll get to do a bunch of damage, and then your angels will get wrathed away, and your Luminarch Ascension will get destroyed. But it does do a ton of damage early, and makes the other players spend a bunch of useful resources just dealing with this one card. So, Luminarch Ascension could definitely be in the deck just because of that, and because we do care about tokens. Like, we will be running, um, uh, what's its name, uh, Anointed Procession and whatnot. But it's at its best in the early part of the game, <clears throat> where players can't attack you, as opposed to later in the game when you've got enough defenses where attacking you is not great. Because they just need you to lose life uh, during their turn. And it doesn't matter what causes you to lose life either, like... If you have a fetch land and you're waiting until the opponent's end of turn to crack it, make sure you wait until this ability has triggered and resolved uh, before you crack a fetch land or anything like that, because otherwise the one life loss will stop this thing from actually working that turn. <clears throat> but yeah, the, that is what it does in most games if it shows up early enough, and if it shows up later, it's kind of a dead card normally, because either you will get attacked because of it and take too much damage, or it's not going... Like, it still takes um, a full turn cycle to get online where it's vulnerable, and damaging you delays that even further, so yeah. But if you get it out in the first couple of turns, you tend to do a lot of damage to a couple of players, and you get um, the benefit of them having to spend usually like two to three cards to deal with your one card and they've lost all that life in the meantime so yeah usually worth the effort when it comes when it goes into the deck but i don't think we need it for this deck and we've got enough others cool stuff going on and it never wins the game normally Every once in a while, like, other players have not the greatest draws and can't interact with it properly, and you just curb stomp everybody. Uh, but that's, like, the outlier. That's the end of the bell curve type of game with that card. Most of the time, you deal, like, 12 or 16 points of damage divided up amongst the table, and then your uh, Angel Maker gets blown up. And then your angels get killed, and then you're back to where you were. But usually that costs like two cards to do. So you spent one card, opponents between the three of them spent like two cards, and you dealt like 12 to 16 damage. That's not terrible. So probably one of the better rates you can get. So yeah, I do like Luminarch Ascension in Commander, especially if you're a token heavy deck, but still not needed for this deck. Real quick, though, I feel like I scrolled past a bunch of stuff after adding the fetch land to the list. Uh, target permanent to owner's hand, gain four life. Plus two in flying. Rents damage, gains life. Doesn't let the thing untap. Two, four. Uh, destroy target attacking creature without flying. Uh, whenever you put a card into your graveyard from anywhere, you may put a quest counter on it. Remove five quest counters. Sacrifice it. Target player shuffles their graveyard into their library. Okay, so no. <coughs> uh, this one lets you get an equipment, right? Yeah. So no. Discards a card. Right of replication. Royal Elemental. We're not going to run, and then we have Scalding Tarn, which we are, because it's another fetch land. I can 
get our tundra or our hallowed fountain. Draw a card for each ally you control. Uh, ally creature. You know, you have ally creatures you control gain flying. Flying first strike vigilance. No. Three damage will be dealt to target creature or player this turn. No. <clears throat> How do we get a worse healing salve? Like, how did that happen? Like, at least Healing Salve, you can also gain three life. Uh, land on your battlefield under your control, defender until end of turn. And nobody was running Healing Salve, like, ever. Spell Pierce. Sphinx of War Isle. Mm. Sphinx of Lost Truths. Yeah, go to that, go to the landfall, go to the puma. <clears throat> Summoner's Bane. Gain eight life? No. Mm. Mm. Also no good old trusty machete, good old bird ally, different catacombs. No. Turn two target creatures to their owner's hand. Born charge, wind rider, eel, and the world queller. Choose a card type if you do, each player sacrifices a permanent of that type. I mean, it's only at the beginning of the upkeep, and, like, we can generate large numbers of artifact creatures, and potentially other card types, too, by copying, you know, if we copy Ancient Den or um, Sea of the Sea Nod, then we have a 1-1 one, one artifact creature land at that point, so if we want to sacrifice a land to make everybody else have to lose a land, we can do that. That being said, I don't think World Queller itself is that good. And I don't want to have to make enough copies of it that it's making everybody else sacrifice like five permanents a turn. So. Alright, so that was Zendikar. Now we need World Wake. Uh, Admonition Angel, no. Aether Trade Winds, no. Still tapped and under your control, untap it. I don't think we need that. Uh, multi Kicker, right? <sighs> Flying enters the battlefield under your control, gain life equal to that creature's power. No. I don't think we need Basilisk Collar. No. No, no. I don't think we need colonnade either. Blue elemental creature, yeah. So land, probably not though. Everflowing chalice is a terrible thing to copy with Urza because it won't have been kicked, and so it won't have any counters on it. But do we want it anyway as a mana rock? Maybe. So I'm going to add it to the list even though there's no guarantee. Blowing chalice. We'll actually want it. Uh, colorless Eldrazi spells cost two less. Search your library for a colorless creature card, reveal it, and put it in your hand. No. Battlefield under your control, Fledging Griffin gains flying. Flying. Arian Zendicon, Hot of Freeblade, no. Halmar Excavator, no. Uh, 
Uh, combat damage to a player, destroy target equipment. No. Pinfall, no. 3 1 flying pro lands. Exile target creature enchantment. What will we be getting from Jace the Mind Sculptor exactly? Probably not enough. Like, nothing that this deck desperately needs. Yep, yeah, sorry, Jace. You're just not doing what the deck actually needs you to do. Ally clone. Flying. It's one plus one that has flying. Pro red. Spells gain us life. Two life for each time it was kicked. No. Lone lion. Lodestone golem. Lodestone Golem is hilarious if we're going to, you know, just keep making more copies of it. Make all of our opponents non-artifact spells. Well, ours too, but we won't have quite so many. If I'm considering Canonist, I'm considering Lodestone Golem for the same reason. We'll just eventually get to the point where opponents can't do anything. Because their spells are too expensive. Also, we are considering a uh, sphere of resistance, so same principle applies. Pilgrim's Eye, probably not. I'd rather copy a uh, sad robot at that point. Raging Ravine, Razor Boomerang. Spent three damage from an instant or sorcery. Out oh, from next three damage as source of your choice. It just cares if they cast a red instant or sorcery beforehand for the trap cost. Exile target land you control, then return it to the battlefield. Plains has first strike and lifelink. Memory for any number of non land cards, exile them, then shuffle your library. Sound Forge. You can target tapped creature to owner's hand. Or another ally, so probably not. Gain lifelink. Let me put a plus one plus one counter on Paladin. Didn't think so. All lands are indestructible. Or my lands are indestructible. I think that's always been true of Terror Eternal. Uh, Fada Adele. Let's us steal artifacts from our opponent's decks. We do still have to pay the mana cost on them, though, so it's not like um acquisition or whatever like the bribery that works on artifacts so maybe not you control untap title for yeah tied force elemental no, no. Should we return a land? No. No. Don't think so. And wins Endicon. No. Okay. So that was World Wake. Now Rise of the Eldrazi. Well, we know one card we want from Rise of the Eldrazi. Whether or not we'll find any other cards. <sighs> the biggest problem with All is Dust is that a bunch of our artifacts from, like, Alara Block are going to be colored in some of our later artifacts because of that. So we're not guaranteed to 
have everything be colorless, even if we're just making token copies of it. The token copies, though, I did it again. Let me just double check Urza. His game text. So we pop back over here. We go Urza. Oops. Token that's a copy of Tyra Fag, except it's a 1 1 soldier creature in addition to its other types. Alright, so it will copy colors. So it's not a 1 1 colorless artifact creature. So yeah, if we copy, if we activate, like, um,. The liquid metal cards, and we turn one of our permanents into an artifact so that we can make a copy of it. The copy won't be colorless either. So we would lose those, but we also lose the colored artifacts. Urza will die to this thing. Um, it's really frustrating because we have so many colorless cards in the deck that would not die to this. So maybe it's still worth considering, but. Probably not. Yeah, I think we can skip all his dust for now. LT, put that many charge counters on it. Charge counter, you gain two life and draw a card. That, no, that. We gain rebound, but that's not a big thing in our deck. More level counters. Nope. No, 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 no. And the land you control to owner's hand. No, no, no. Tap, doesn't untap. Whenever you become the target of a spell, you may untap it. No. No. Maybe. Dreamstone. Hedron. Yeah, having my things have three tap, sacrifice this thing, draw three cards, and tap to add three mana of any, or not any color, three colorless mana. Seems okay. I don't think we need Echo Mage. Plus one, plus one, plus zero, plus four. Good old Conscription. No. No. Use Band. Uh, no. 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 Gideon. No. Don't actually need him. Uh, no to that. No to that. Run all combat damage that would be dealt to guard Gomazoa. No. 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 All combat damage would be dealt this turn by attacking creatures. No. Uh, plus X plus X where X is its mana value. No, because we need to level up each one of these things. I'm looking at it as like, oh, it has damage prevention, and each copy would prevent more and more damage to my things until even Blasphemous Act can't hurt me, but I have to level each one of them up individually, so no. That guy. No to it that betrays. Again, I'm not spending the mana necessary to level these guys up. Who cares about auras? No. No. Uh, look at its controller's hand. No. Good old lighthouse chronologist. Except it needs seven counters on it before it does the thing. Then each one of them after that gets like progressively more out of hand, but yeah. 
Don't think so. Creatures your opponent's control can't be activated. Sonic Wall, Narcolepsy, put a near death experience. Which creature you control and has rebound. Out of this world. No, no. Path Razor, no. Or blocking creature. Tap X target permanents or untap X permanents. Draw cards equal number of cards in target opponent's hand and rebound. No. No. <coughs> Renegade Doppelganger. Another creature enters the battlefield under your control. You may have Renegade Doppelganger become a copy of that creature until end of turn. No. Also no. Nope. No. Draw a card, then put a 1-1 one -one counter on it. No. Bone 1. No. No. No to student. Put a charge counter on Spellblade. Deals combat damage to a player. You may draw X cards where X is the number of charge counters on it. Nope. Survival cache. A time of heroes. Uh, search your library for an R card, put it into your hand, and shuffle. No. Training grounds. There we go. I found the card that I knew I was going to put in here. Making Urza four mana to activate, and then cloning it so that way we can make it like one mana to activate Urza. Exactly where I want to be. And sign it Master, Ulamog, Ulamog. Ooh. Go to the Totem Armor Lady. The teacher. Draw a card. And. Nope. Okay. And from there we go to Scars. Nice artifact heavy set. We go through all of New Phyrexia. That's okay, you can search. I will let you. I'm just going to be over here leaning back on the creaky chair. Uh, prevent the next one damage dealt to target creature or player. Next two damage dealt to target artifact creature this turn. of the next end step only if you have metal craft no no uh, has double strike no uh, three or more artifacts plus two plus two and flying plus four minus one <coughs> flying in first strike on tap X charge counters on it till end of turn it becomes an artifact creature. Uh, Metalcraft, it's a 4 4. Clone Shell, don't need the contagion cards. 
Corpse Cur, no. Don't want any infect. Pulling Deus, no. Let's put into a graveyard from the battlefield. Draw a card. Mm, don't think we need the axe. <clears throat> oh man, Darksteel Mirror is the only creature that gets upgraded. I don't have to circle the number of artifacts you control, and it's indestructible and attacks each turn if able. Oh, but we're going to make it a 1-1, one, one, so that's going to override the power and toughness thing, right? Original permit with the listed exceptions and nothing else, unless that permit is copying something else. Any counters, auras, any copy effects that have changed its power and toughness and so on. Is a soldier, its base power and toughness is 1-1. One, one. These are copyable values. So yeah, even if we copy it, it's going to be, it's just going to be an indestructible 3-3. Three, three. It's never going to be a, um, it's not going to keep growing. It'll only grow the original juggernaut. Um, here's indestructible. Sentinel's indestructible too. It has vigilance. And flash, so we have three three vigilance indestructible creatures when we copy it. Go circlet. Destroy all other permits except for lands and tokens. This Elspeth I might be able to get behind. Uh she starts off at four and pluses once to get within range of blowing everything up. She's still vulnerable at that point, but that means the opponents need to commit the resources to kill her. And as long as that's not just one spell from their hand, that's probably worth it. She might not make the cut, but... Also, she can gain us tons of life for the creatures that we have in play, and she can make a bunch more creatures... That are soldiers, so things like coat of arms would care. Ooh, excuse me again. And we can't target that with Urza to make more copies of it, because we would have three artifacts in play. It's put in the graveyard, pay blue to draw a card. No. Plus two, plus two. Next end step. Nearest battlefield sacrifice unless you return an artifact you control to owner's hand. <coughs> I'm a two, two artifact creature with flying. <coughs> or you can just spend white mana to do that. Oops. Yeah, I keep, like, reflexively uh, right-clicking. That's the constant clicking you hear in the background. Plus one, plus one, gains your choice of flying, trample, or haste. <laughs> yeah, I keep putting this in artifact heavy decks, like artifact creature heavy decks, and he still never makes it all the way to the end. Infect thing. Other blue creatures you control get plus one, plus one. Blue target artifact you control becomes blue until end of turn. Tap and untap blue creature you control. Add two mana. Spend this mana only to cast artifact spells or activate artifact abilities. <sighs> yeah, I don't see that one happening. I did need to take a moment, but... Artifacts you control have Shroud as long as there are three or more. Yeah, no, can't run her, because then I can't target any of my stuff to make more stuff. That kind of defeats the whole purpose. No, no, no to 
Kemba. Kemba? Yep, Kemba. Um, Skyguard, gain two life? No. Sack three artifacts to tutor an artifact onto the battlefield when we can make artifact tokens with our commander. Yeah. Yeah, no, Tinker is banned for a reason. So, a lot of the bad Tinkers are still pretty good. Go to a bonus. Oh, there's liquid metal coating. Oh, no, it's liquid metal coating. It's not even liquid. Liquid metal coating. Well, at least that's not a real word. Is liquid metal coating a real word? Like, would that have worked? No. Okay. Now, caught off the Forge Masters. What, a 5-drop? 3-5 construct? There we go. And liquid metal coating is a 2-drop artifact. For that effect. Two plus a uh, whenever it's the target of the spell or belly deals two damage to target creature or player. You mana one five. And it's the battlefield. If you control three or more artifacts, return target creature to owner's hand. It's a Lux Cannon, Memnite, Mimic Vat. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Mind Slaver is legendary. Otherwise, we could do all kinds of crazy shenanigans with that. Just take everybody's turn for them. Which I suppose is why, one of the many reasons why it's legendary. Also, I think we already had Mind Slaver on the list anyway. Just because, but I can see it not making the list at this point. Um... So I have to mimic that, and then it makes token copies of it. I don't think we need mimic that, but... Ox Opal. Yeah, the other day I was having <clears throat> the hardest time remembering what Mox Opal's actual name was. <clears throat> like, I just kept calling it the Metalcraft Mox. Uh, you can tell how much, um, like, modern I played by the fact that I could forget the actual name of the card. Although I think it's banned now, so. <clears throat> but yeah, we can definitely run that in our super artifact heavy deck. Most likely. We'll have to see what it looks like when we're getting close to done. Think we need Battle Sphere? I think we have enough other stuff going on. Although spending, you know, six mana to make a three-three Battle Sphere and it's four three-three tokens. Maybe I do still need Battle Sphere, or at least to consider it. Get out of the middle of that word. Here, Battle Sphere. All right, Battle Sphere is all one word. Because uh, that is an awful lot of power to be able to add to the board at instant speed. It's a mere construct. It's a mere construct. Or mere. Their name sounding like meager. Copy of progenitor. Or propagator, rather. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think we need the galvanizer either. Cast mirror spells or activate mirror ability. Three tap, return target mirror from your graveyard to your hand. Uh, cast an artifact spell, pay one, make a mirror. Target player loses two life. Infect creature. 
unblockable, enters the battlefield, target creature is unblockable this turn. Can't run spell bomb. Put a death mantle. Origin spell bomb. Makes a 1 1 mirror. And when it's put into the graveyard, you can pay white to draw a card. Probably not. Lady of Mirror, no. Perilous Mirror, again, probably not. Oh, Perilous Mirror is fun to make copies of because then when the opponent finally gets around to killing them, get to deal all the damage, assuming they don't get farewelled or something. Put on the bottom of my deck with, like, Terminus and whatnot. Um, no to Precursor Golem, because they just get dealt with very easily with targeted removal, or mass removal, so kind of getting wrecked on both ends. Battlefield, you may exile an artifact card from your hand, and then it makes token copies of it by paying the casting cost. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we need Quicksilver Gargantuan. Ratchet Bomb, no. Battlefield, return to our artifact card from your graveyard to your hand. Gain life equal to its mana cost. <coughs> Seven mana, six, four. I think Mirrodin's going to be, Scars of Mirrodin's going to be the last one. So that was an artifact or enchantment. My voice is getting just a little bit rough, and the water's not helping as much. And also, I have to be to work at 2 o'clock, so... Normally, I need at least half an hour, but we'll take a little extra time to get ready. I've had, like, the past few days off, thanks to Christmas, so... That's been nice, but I have to get back to it now. Graveyard to your hand. No. No. Um, play if you can draw three more artifacts that player mills for. Oh, no. Need Sea Chrome Coast. Plus one, plus one. First strike. No. Semblance Anvil. No. Shape anew. No. No. Deal this turn. Steady progress. Steel Hellkite. <clears throat> Stoic Rebuttal. Strata Scythe. All of these so far. Is Equip gains first strike and lifelink. No. Sword. No. No. Can't run that. Actual Tempered Steel. Do we want an actual Tempered Seal? The irony is that if we make artifact copies, like we turn Tempered Seal into an artifact and copy it, it won't actually buff itself. So it'll be a 1-1 one -one that's buffing all of my other artifact creatures. So that doesn't mean we can't run it, or at least consider running it. Power of Calamities, no... I don't think I want my blue or white trigon. What does the white one do again? Uh, does it heal, gains life? Yeah. I was going to say gains life, prevents damage. Bring it mages of reprint. We already have it, right? I believe that's true. I have double strike and lifelink. And turn aside. Twisted image, no. Means flying until end of turn, untap it, no. Tap target, artifact, creature, or land, activate, yeah. Okay. Exile target permit you own, return to the battlefield under your control at the beginning of the next end step. Creatures are unblockable this turn. And you get an emblem with whenever you cast a spell, exile target permanent. So I'll target permanent you own, then return to the battlefield under your control at the beginning of the next end step. Minus one, creatures are unblockable this turn. Mm. Eh, probably not. If 
five life. Good old worm coil engine. Worm coil engine I think we have to consider also because the tokens that are copies of the original worm coil engine will then die into three three, you know, lifelink and death touch creatures anyway, so It'll be a 3-3 three, three lifelink death touch that will die into a 5-5 five, five lifelink and a 5-5 five, five death touch, in theory, in our deck. So, I think I am obligated to run the Worm Coil engine. Alright, well, that's going to do it for me, for today. So, I hope you've enjoyed getting back to form with picking cards for Commander, and I hope you're looking forward to seeing what Urza looks like when he's done. But that's going to do it for me for right now, so we'll save this, and I will see you all next time. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks for watching.